Hello everybody and welcome to our fourth video lecture. Today we'll be talking about change of variables for multiple integrals. This topic is motivated by u substitution, a very familiar topic to us for integrals with one variable. In u substitution, we rewrite an integral of the form integral from a to b of f of x dx as an integral from c to d of f of g of u times g prime of u du where here x is g of u, a is g of c, and b is g of d. Graphically, I want to think about the function g of u as being a transformation from the u line to the x line. So here I've drawn a one-dimensional line, which I'm calling the u line, and a separate one-dimensional line, which I'm calling the x line. And g is a function which takes the u line to the x line. In particular, it takes the point C and sends it to the point A. And it takes the point D and sends it to the point B. So for a, a simple enough function, it'll take the interval between C and D and send it to the interval between A and B. In other words, G is a transformation which takes the domain of integration of the first integral, which is going from a to b, to the domain of the second integral, which is going from c to d. The addition to the second integral in the form of g prime of u comes from the chain rule. I sort of like to think about it as an anti-chain rule, or a chain rule for integrals. For change of variable with multiple integrals, we'll have an analog of this, and we'll call it the Jacobian. This is a term that we also mentioned briefly when we talked about integrating in polar coordinates, as well as both cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Today, one of the things we'll do is analyze a little bit more about where this comes from in terms of the geometry. For double integrals, we can also do change of variables. In the previous discussion, our change of variables began with the substitution x equals g of u. However, here, we have a lot more freedom because for double integrals, everything is a function of two variables. So I have two variables that I want to substitute. So I also need to come up with a substitution for y. And I can substitute from two variables as well. So instead of x equals g of u, I can substitute x equals some function g of u and v, and y is equal to some function h of u and v. And this is my substitution now. As you might notice right away, the substitution can be a lot more intricate. For example, let's consider the substitution x equals u minus v and y equals u plus v. We can think about what this does as a function and before our transformation was going from the u line to the x line but now it's going to go from the uv plane to the xy plane. So I've drawn my uv plane and I've drawn my xy plane and I'm thinking about the function here as a function from the uv plane to the xy plane. For example, you can see that it takes the point 0, 0 to 0 minus 0 and 0 plus 0, so it takes it to the point 0, 0 again. The point 1, 0 is taken from the uv plane to the xy plane to the point 1 minus 0, 1 plus 0 so the point 1, 1. The point 0, 1 in the uv plane is taken to the point 0, minus 1, 0, plus 1, so the point minus 1, 1. The point 1, 1 is taken to 1, minus 1, which is 0, and 1, plus 1, which is 2, so the point 0, 2. So the rectangle formed by these vertices over here is taken to the diamond with the vertices in the xy plane. And one can immediately guess that this will come with certain natural advantages. For example, typically integrating over a rectangle in two dimensions is much easier than, than integrating over a diamond shape in two dimensions, just because it's much easier to parameterize the domain of integration. So using a transformation like this one can dramatically simplify certain integrations. A 
transformation like this one also automatically comes equipped with an inverse transformation going from the XY plane to the UV plane, as long as the original transformation is one-to-one. -one. In particular, we can think about a transformation as a function t from the two-dimensional real plane to the two-dimensional real plane. And it takes a point uv and sends it to a new point, g of uv, h of uv. Because we can think about a transformation like a function, we can think about the associated inverse function, which we call the inverse transformation. If my original transformation takes a region S of the x y, excuse me, of the uv plane to a region R of the x y plane, then the inverse transformation will take the region R of the xy plane to the region S of the uv plane. To figure out what the inverse transformation is specifically, we use the same ploy that we do to figure out inverse functions. Remember, to find the inverse of a function f of x, what we did was we set y equal to f of x, and we solved for x. Because x will then be f inverse of y. So for example, if f of x is equal to x cubed plus 1, I set y equal to x cubed plus 1, then I get y minus 1 is equal to x cubed. And taking the cube root of both sides, I end up with the cube root of y plus 1, or sorry, y minus 1, is equal to x. And this is our inverse function. Specifically, this is f inverse of y. So f inverse of x is just obtained by replacing y with x. Specifically, it's x minus 1 to the power of 1 third. We'll use the same ploy here. Starting out, we have the two equations. x equals g of u and v, and y equals h of u and v. And what I want to do is I want to solve this for u and v. As an example of this, we can consider our previous transformation. There, x was equal to u minus v, and y was equal to u plus v. So I want to solve this system of equations for u and v. To start out, let me just solve the first equation for u. That says that u will be equal to x plus v. Now if I substitute this into the second equation, this results in the y equal to x plus v plus b. This tells me that x minus y, or sorry, y minus x is equal to 2v. So v is equal to y minus x over 2. And now that I know what v is, I can put that back into our equation for u. This gives me that u is equal to y minus x over 2 plus x which I can simplify as y plus x over 2. This defines a transformation from the xy plane to the uv plane. And if this transformation here is t, this is the inverse transformation, t inverse. In other words, the function t, which takes a point uv and returns the point u minus v, u plus v, has inverse given by taking the point x, y, and returning to us the point y minus x over 2, y plus x over 2. Let's consider a second example. 
Let's think about our polar coordinate transformation as an actual transformation from R2 to R2. For polar coordinates, we know that x is given by r times cosine of theta, and y is given by r times sine of theta. So this should define a map from the r theta plane to the xy plane. Notice I don't have to use u and v for all of my coordinate transformations. I can choose different variables, like r and theta, if choosing those variables is more natural, or if it looks cooler. I mean, one of our objectives when we're doing math, and this is on the internet now, so it must be true, is to make things look really cool. We can see here where this transformation takes a rectangle in the r theta plane. If I just draw a particular rectangle going from c to d in r and from alpha to beta in theta, to figure out what this goes to in the xy plane under this transformation, it suffices to check where the vertices go. For all sufficiently nice transformations, the area inside these vertices will get mapped to the area inside the vertices in the image. So that's at least a pretty good rule of thumb, if every now and again it sometimes doesn't quite work out that way. At least for the transformations in this class, this will be the situation. And we don't really need to worry too much about whether or not this works out. But for more advanced classes, of course, this could be a question that needs to be answered. I should also be a little bit more careful about what I mean by the area between the vertices and the image, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The vertices of these rectangles get mapped to points in the xy plane, which are living on these rays at angles alpha and beta respectively, and whose distances from the origin are c and d respectively. To figure out where the rest of the points in the rectangle go, that is, these points I'm filling in in blue here. The key strategy is to figure out where the boundary values go. So I want to think about what this curve does on the lower part of this rectangle. Here, r is ranging between value c and value d, but my angle is fixed at alpha. I can think about all the points in polar coordinates whose angle is fixed at alpha but whose distance from the origin is ranging from c to d. And I realize I have a bit of a typo here. c is the distance from the origin to the first point, so c should be closer to this value here. There we go. So where does this red edge get moved to? Well, it's going to go from this point, which is a distance c from the origin at an angle alpha, to this point here, which is the distance d from the origin at an angle alpha. And the angle alpha from the x-axis will never change. So it has to move up this line. This edge here will consist of points which are always a distance c from the origin, but where the angle is changing from alpha to beta. So I need points that are always a distance c from the origin. So that's going to form a piece of a circle going this way where the angle is changing, but the distance from the origin isn't. This top side of the rectangle will consist of points whose angle from the x-axis is always beta, but whose distance from the origin ranges from c to d. This is the point with angle beta, which is distance c from the origin. This is the point with angle beta, with distance d from the origin. So we're just filling in all the points in between. Finally, I'm thinking about this last side. This is all the points whose angle changes from alpha to beta, but which are distance d from the origin. So I'm wanting to preserve the distance from the origin and change the angle. So I'm getting this part of a circle here. So notice that these curves here and here are not straight curves. These are, uh, these are actually curved as they're parts of various circles. And now, the idea is that all the inside here should fill into the inside here. So the inside of that rectangle has to fit inside these sort of curves. This is some version of an intermediate value theorem. My red boundary values are my extreme values, and by some continuity, I need to get all the values in between. 
Of course, proving something like that takes a little bit of doing and is a topic for a more advanced class. Our main application for these change of variables in two dimensions, of course, is integration. So here we have, We want to answer the following question. How can we use change of variables to do integrals in two dimensions? One of the main issues that we run into here is that an arbitrary transformation can take a region in a one plane and make it much larger or much smaller in another plane. For example, if I think about this transformation that we already thought about quite a bit in detail, I took a region here, which was a one by one, so it had an area of one, into a region over here with an area that is a little bit different. In particular, if I cock my head at a 45 degree angle, this is still a nice rectangular region, these are 90 degree angles, but the side lengths here have changed. Each side has a length equal to the square root of 2, so the area of the image is actually 2. In order to figure out how to get integrals in the xy plane and change them into integrals in the uv plane, but have it so that when we integrate in the uv plane, we still get the answer we would have gotten before in the xy plane, we're going to need to compensate for this sort of changes in area that happen when we do these coordinate transformations. Let's try to do this for a more arbitrary change of variables. Let's start out by considering an arbitrary change of variables. We'll call it t. t here maps the uv plane to the xy plane. Now I want to think about a generic box inside the uv plane. My box has its bottom leftmost vertex at the point CD and has a width of DU and a height of DV. I'm thinking about DU and DV here as being some very, very small numbers. So I'm thinking about a tiny little box. And I want to think about where this box is sent under the transformation T. The point CD is sent to some point AB of the XY plane so that here a is equal to g of cd and b is equal to h of cd. I can similarly figure out where the remainder of the vertices are sent. However, because I'm thinking about du and dv as being very very small, I can cheat a bit. For example, I can say that g of c plus du D, C plus DUD is going to be G at CD plus the DU times the partial derivative with respect to X of G at CD. In other words, I'm using linear approximation to simplify my answer. A similar expression holds for H, so this left point, which is C plus DU, D is going to be sent to the point described by these two entries. So this point here should be A plus DU times G sub U. B times DU H sub U. Similarly, this point here in the UV plane 
will go to a certain point here in the xy plane. The argument works the same as before, except with par instead of partial derivatives with respect to u, I'm going to end up with partial derivatives with respect to v. So I end up with the point a plus dv times g sub v plus b times dv times h sub v. A little typo there. Times h sub v. Perfect. And our final point becomes a plus du times g of u plus dv times g of v, comma, b times du times h of u plus dv times h of v. So really, my tiny rectangle is being transformed into the shape which is given by this parallelogram. Now it's very important here that I'm saying tiny rectangle. As we saw before, for other transformations, such as the one that we saw in polar coordinates, a rectangle doesn't have to go to something like a parallelogram. There it went to something with sides which were curved and not straight. But if I choose a tiny enough rectangle, even inside the r theta plane, that polar plane, I'm going to end up with something which is approximately the shape of this parallelogram. And in the limit, as our rectangle gets smaller and smaller, it's going to become this parallelogram. Since when we integrate, we add up the value of a function times bases, which are formed by small, small areas, and just add up a whole bunch of these things, we only really need to consider the case when the rectangle is very, very, very small. So this is good enough for purposes of integration. And what I want to do here is I want to compare the relative areas of both sides. On the left-hand side, the rectangle that I have has a very obvious area. The area there is given by the width times the height, so it's du times dv. On the right-hand side, calculating the area is a little bit more complicated. One thing we can do to get this area is we can remember that the area of a parallelogram is given by the magnitude of the cross product of the corresponding vectors. So if I think about a vector representing this side of this parallelogram and a vector representing this side of the parallelogram, and I take their cross product, the vector resulting is going to have a magnitude which defines the area itself. The first area, or sorry, the first vector, say this representing this bottom side here, is going to be given by taking this point here and subtracting the point AB. So it's going to give it's going to have entries simply du times g sub u du times h sub u and then since we need to do cross products in three dimensions I'm thinking about this as a three-dimensional vector but the z component is just zero our second vector is going to have entries dv times g sub v dv times h sub v and our third entry is going to be zero and when I take these guys, when I take their cross product, I end up with the vector 0, 0, and then the third entry is du dv times the quantity guhv minus hugv. So the area is given by the magnitude of this, which will be du times dv times the absolute value of guhv minus hugv. And because this is a typical volume element for a very small volume, this tells us exactly how we can switch from an integral in the xy plane to an integral inside the uv plane. In particular, we have the following theorem. If I have any transformation t, which takes a point uv to g of uv, h of uv, in particular, this is saying that x is g of uv, and y is h of u v, as we were talking about all through before this. This defines some transformation from the u v plane to the x y plane. And if I define this special quantity j to be that typical area element that we just calculated above, then I can take an integral in the x y plane over some region r, and I can transform it into a double integral over some region s inside the uv plane. The only difference here is that I'm going to add the special guy, which is the absolute value of j uv, 
in order to compensate for the fact that areas of different regions will change after we transform. Because of the special role that J of UV plays, we tend to give it a name. J of UV is called the Jacobian of the transformation T. And if the equation for J UV seems kind of difficult to remember, it actually turns out to be not that bad. J of UV specifically is the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix whose entries are partial G partial U, partial G partial V, partial H partial U, partial H partial V. So it has a very nice sort of formula for this. And it's worth pointing out here that when stating this theorem, I've swept under the rug quite a few assumptions that need to go into place. In particular here, my transformation T needs to be sufficiently smooth so that these de derivatives of G and H actually exist. In particular, it needs to have first derivatives, first partial derivatives exist, and those first partial derivatives need to be continuous. Furthermore, I need to assume that the Jacobian is non-vanishing on the set S. I also need to assume that F is continuous on R and that the transformation T is a one-to-one -one transformation from R to S. Speaking of which, I haven't actually told you what S is here. S should be the pre-image of the set R under this transformation. That is to say, it's the image of R under the inverse transformation, which is why we were talking about inverse transformations earlier on. Another way to say this is that S is the way that we describe the previous region R inside the xy plane, but in terms of our new coordinates, u and v. This is an operation that we did many times before when we were converting things from regular Cartesian coordinates into polar coordinates in order to do integrals over coordinate polar coordinates. Oftentimes the way that we'll proceed with that sort of operation is of course to draw a picture just like we did in the polar coordinate case. Let's consider an example. In this example I want to calculate the double integral over r of x, y, d, a where here r is the parallelogram with vertices 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and 0, 2. So r is this diamond shaped region here. If I wanted to do this integral directly, I would have to split this up into two separate integrals based on this additional vertical kink here. And furthermore, I'd have to come up with parameterizations for each of these four different curves. While this is doable, it's a heck of a lot of work. As an alternative, I can remember that I had a nice transformation earlier which went from a rectangle inside a UV plane to this diamond inside the XY plane. Specifically, the transformation which sends U minus V to X and U plus V to Y, or in other words, the point UV to U minus V, U plus V, sends the rectangle from 0 to 1 in U and 0 to 1 V inside the UV plane to this diamond shape inside the XY plane. So in terms of the theorem before, this is my region S, which is getting sent one to one to my region R over here. Now if I want to convert this, re this integral in the XY plane to an integral in the UV plane, I also need to calculate the Jacobian. The Jacobian is equal to the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix formed by the partial derivatives of g and h. Here, g is the function that x was set to, and h is the function that y was set to. So this is the determinant of the matrix, whose entries are, oh, and wouldn't you know it, I have a typo. So these are partial derivatives of functions of u and v, so instead of derivatives with respect to x and y, I need derivatives with respect to u and v. Sorry about that. uv, uv. There we go. So 
So when I take the partial derivative of g with respect to u, I get 1. When I do it with respect to v, I get minus 1. Similarly, when I take the partial derivative of h with respect to u, I have 1. And with respect to v, I also get 1. So the, the Jacobian is the determinant of this constant matrix in this case, which turns out to be 2. This means that the integral that I'm starting out with, the double integral over r of xy dA, can be written as the integral over s of my function that I'm integrating, rewritten in terms of u and v. So using the fact that x is u minus v, this is u minus v, and y is u plus v, so it's times u plus v. And I need to multiply this by the absolute value of the Jacobian, so the absolute value of 2, which of course is just 2, du dv. And now I know that s is a square domain going from 0 to 1 to 0 1. So this is just the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to 1 of this quantity, which is 2 times the quantity u squared minus v squared, du dv. This is a very easy integral to do at this point. I do my innermost integral first, getting the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 thirds u cubed minus uv squared, evaluated from 0 to 1. Whoops, and I uh, should be careful here. That 2 was originally multiplying everything, so this term still has a 2 on it. The integral becomes the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 thirds minus 2v squared dv. I left off my dv up here before. So this becomes 2 thirds v minus 2 thirds v cubed. And I'm going to evaluate this again from 0 to 1. And so my answer is 0. So that's one example. And we'll do the, some more examples in our next video lecture. And we'll also extend these ideas into three dimensions. But that's all for now. So I'll see you guys next time.